This is Caroline Miller, the host of Just Read It. This is a book talk show program where normally Pacific Northwest writers uh, talk about New York Times best-selling books. Every once in a while, though, we break away from that. We manage to get one of the best-selling authors to spend a little time with us. Today, we have a really well-known uh, author, Philip Margolin, uh, master of uh, legal thrillers. And so I want to welcome you, Philip, who, is, by the way, is also a Pacific Northwest writer. Welcome to the program, Philip. Hi, glad for you have me on. Well, it's 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 delight it's delightful to have you with us. Now I want to jump right into it, uh, the program because you are such a pro prolific writer, and you have two books out this year. One came out in March. Uh, I think it's called "The Darkest Place," and you've got another one about to pop out called. Um, Murder at Black Oaks, which I think you said to me is a little different from your normal approach to legal thrillers. So let's start with your telling us a little bit about the book that's currently out and maybe give us a, a differentiation between the second book. What can we expect in the second book? So The, uh, the Darkest Place <clears throat> is the fifth book in the Robin Lockwood series. Uh, that I started, uh, I think it was 2015 or 16. And <clears throat> Robin's an interesting character. Um, I, I have uh, very strong women as the lead in a lot of my books. And sometimes they get into dangerous situations. And uh, <clears throat> I was trying to think how I could make a, a character who could realistically get into a a fight with a male and come out on top. Because in real life, uh, if a man and a woman fight, the man's got upper body strength. He might've done some wrestling or boxing when he was a kid. So uh, <clears throat> usually uh, the man's gonna win. So I was trying to think of how can I fix that problem? And uh, Robin Lockwood uh, worked her way through Yale Law School. She paid her tuition by fighting in Las Vegas on uh, mixed martial arts pay-per-view events. And she was a nationally ranked woman fighter. She retired early in her law school career to concentrate on her, on her uh, law, law career. But <clears throat> in the books, occasionally, <clears throat> she has to face a male in a fighting situation. And I thought, well, uh, the readers will accept this if they know that she's a trained fighter and she continues to train in the book of McGill's gym. Uh, <clears throat> so The Darkest Place is the fifth book in the series. She's an established criminal defense lawyer in Portland, Oregon, and uh, she suffers a horrible tragedy. And I'm not going to tell you what it is because it's a sort of a shocker in the book if you read the series. Uh, in any event, <clears throat> she... Uh, goes home to Elk Grove, which is a small Midwestern town where she, where she grew up. And she goes back to stay with her mother uh, to try to deal with this tragedy. And while she's there, a local lawyer uh, has gotten a very unusual case that is a little bit over his head. And he, he is friends with one of the uh, uh, Robin's brothers and, and asks her if she would just help him out with some advice. And she ends up co-counseling. So the idea for the book <clears throat> came from a, a Oregon Criminal Defense Lawyers Association seminar on junk science that I attended uh, and I think it was 2018 or 19, right before the pandemic. And I've always been fascinated by junk science. Junk science is uh, evidence in quotes that a uh, prosecutor will put on in his case in chief to try to prove that the client is guilty. And it's, it's, it's presented as scientific evidence. And 
And if you have an expert who's a scientist, most jurors, uh, even if they're really smart, don't know every area of science. And so you can win a case as a prosecutor if you can present scientific evidence uh, that supports your position. And what, what really got me fascinated was the shaken baby syndrome. And uh, <clears throat> uh, there have been numbers of people who have been put in prison uh, when a child of theirs uh, has no external marks of abuse, you know, no black and blue marks or broken bones, but the child has <clears throat> internal uh, damage, uh, retinal hem hemorrhages, uh, bleeding on the brain. Uh, and and uh, what happened was in the 1970s, Nobody was talking about spousal abuse, child abuse, sort of put under the, you know, people didn't want to talk about it. And some doctors were uh, confused because they were treating these ch children with no marks of abuse, but they appeared to have internal injuries. And so they concluded that <clears throat> the injuries must have been because the, the uh, child was shaken so severely that the head went back and forth and back and forth and bounced the brain uh, off of the skull and, and create these injuries. And when they did this uh, uh, initially, they talked about this theory initially, they had no intention of it ever being used in the criminal trial. They just wanted to educate pa parents, uh, doctors, <clears throat> you know, don't shake the baby, be careful with it. Well, prosecutors jumped on this and started using it to convict people. And the idea would be that the last person who was with the child probably did this. And um, <clears throat> it began being accepted. And when I initially heard about it, I thought it was a proven scientific theory. Uh, and I'm not going to go in depth into why it's not, because I do that in the book. But there is a lot of concern that this there's no scientific basis whatsoever for this shaken baby syndrome. And I have a major trial in the book where both sides of, this, of the uh, discussion is presented. Uh, but there's also, it's not just a, a discussion of shaken baby. Uh, there is a surrogate mother uh, who uh, is the person charged with, with uh, child abuse but she's also uh, on the run because her uh, husband is murdered. There's oh. hidden gold. Um, <laughs> there's uh, there are mobsters. So it's it's there's a lot of stuff going on in the darkest place. And you have Robin trying to deal with this horrible tragedy and and her grief. Okay, so let's uh, can we move on, Phil? Because I'm already hooked, and I want to see what you've got with this upcoming book, The Murder of Black Oaks, that you say is different from your traditional. Yeah, it's really different. Um, when I was growing, re the reason I write murder mysteries is when I was a kid, I was a voracious reader. I started reading two to three books a week in elementary school. And uh, my favorite books <clears throat> were murder mysteries, Earl Stanley Gardner, uh, Perry Mason's, Agatha Christie's, uh, John Dixon Carr did the locked room murder mysteries, and Ellery Queen, who is the king of the, of the fair play mystery where uh, there are clues strewn throughout the murder mystery, and there's usually some absolutely bizarre crime that seems to be impossible, and yet if you can figure out the clues, you can get who done it. So uh, I decided, uh, because the darkest place is as a, as a title sort of warns you, has a, it's a, has a lot of dark stuff in it. And I decided to lighten stuff up. So I have uh, an homage to all of these wonderful murder mystery writers from the 1930s and 40s during the golden age of mystery writing. And uh, Robin is called, uh, summoned to the top of Solitude Mountain to Black Oaks, which is a complete brick by brick recreation of a haunted manor on the British moors with a werewolf curse, 
Uh, and she, she uh, gets there and uh, a la Agatha Christie and all these other guys, uh, there is a horrible storm that blocks the road so that they're isolated in the mansion. Um, it's stormy night. Yeah, it, it is. And that's one of the things I like about writing in Portland. When I start my book, it was a dark and stormy night. I'm just being really accurate. I look out the window and say, oh, yeah, it's a dark and stormy night. That's about 90% of the time. So anyway, she's trapped in a horrible storm with lightning. Uh, the roads are blocked. There's an escape uh, madman from the hospital for the criminally insane running around. Uh, like I said, a werewolf curse. And to top it off, and I had the most fun doing this, a person is murdered in an old cage elevator, <clears throat> stabbed through the heart with a knife, and the handle of the knife is a werewolf. It's a half human, half wolf claw in silver, but it's too wide to fit through the bars, which means that the killer had to be inside the cage elevator when the murder occurred, yet the cage is stuck between the second and third floor People have been coming up from the bottom and down from the top, and no one sees anyone leave the cage. So, so uh, it's uh, one of these John Dixon Carr locked room murders. How could it possibly happen? And I just had a ball writing it, and it, it's not real serious at all. <laughs> so uh, this was this was one of the books I had the most fun writing. Sounds like you had more than a ball. Maybe a couple of malt whiskeys. Or... <laughs> To, to help you. Well, let's talk a little bit about you so that uh, people uh, get to know you a little better. You said you were a prolific reader, and um, I'm wondering, uh, you mentioned, I know when we talked about uh, Earl Stanley Gardner and Ellery Queen being a, a big influence, but your work is not called a mystery. It's called um, a thriller, a legal thriller. Is there a difference between the two in your mind? And, and in addition, um, how do you distinguish yourself from the styles of, of Queen and Gardner? Well, actually, the, the, my books are called legal thrillers, but they also could be considered murder mysteries, yes. because I, I always have a surprise ending, and I have uh, clues that you can use. So usually the definition of a mystery is there's a murder, but you don't know who did it. There are se several suspects and the detective comes in and tries to figure out who done it. <clears throat> and then at the very end, there's a big reveal where, you know, everyone's in the library and this, the detective says, and here's how I figured this out. Uh, the thrillers, usually you know who the killer is. And they're more action oriented. And it's a lot of times you have a, a someone in peril. Uh, you know, they're, it's the, uh, just the regular one man or woman going about their daily life who gets involved with some incredible international conspiracy. So my books are a hybrid. They, there is always a lawyer and a murder. So you have a murder trial usually. But there's also the mystery element. Plus, as I said, with Robin and a lot of my other uh, characters, there are action situations. I, I have a lot of action in the books in addition. So it's, there is the mystery aspect. There's the clues. Uh, usually, you don't know who done it. And at the very end, there's a surprising revelation where my, uh, my lawyer hero works out the clues and says, okay, it could have been this guy, this guy, and this guy, but this one's the killer and here's why. So my, my books are hybrids. They're mysteries and they're thrillers. Okay, that, that's very enlightening because I've been scratching my head uh, to distinguish between the two. Now, let me talk about your plotting because I listened to <clears throat> several interviews that you had done before and you, are pretty clear that you work from an outline. Uh, and that would make sense because if you're dropping clues, they've got to take us somewhere. Um, <clears throat> how about spontaneity? Have you ever, ha ever had the occasion where you got so far in your 
outline, but you decided you needed a new character, or do you pretty much stick to the to the the, the line itself? Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> the answer is yes to both things. Uh, so I was a criminal defense lawyer for 25 years. I did 30 homicide cases. Uh, I did death penalty murder cases. I argued in the U.S. Supreme Court. And when you're a lawyer, you have to dot every I and cross every T. You've got to be very, very organized before you even get into your uh, trial. I always used to say that uh, when I was uh, doing a case, if I fell asleep, it meant everything was going great. I could take a nap. There were no surprises because I'd figured out everything that was going to happen. But if I was awake, I was in big trouble. That meant some surprise had happened. So um, translating the, the legal preparation to the writing, I do extensive outlines. My, my system is to get an idea. Now, ideas are tiny. Books are big. So I have to get an idea that's big enough to fill up a 400-page book. And then I spend, uh, once, once get the idea, and I figure out the ending. I, always, I won't write a word uh, until I figure out who did it and how are they going to get caught. And uh, I'm not lying about that. Um, Executive Privilege, which is one of my best books, I got the idea for that in 1995 and didn't publish it until 2008. And the reason was, it's a fabulous idea. Could the president of the United States be a serial killer? The problem was, I could never figure out the ending. I had characters, I had situations, uh, but I just couldn't figure out how with the Secret Service around and uh, you know, all the press and everything. How would you get away with it? And it took me 10 years to figure out that ending. And once I did, it turned out to be, like I said, one of the best books I've written. It's one of my best sellers. Uh, so once I've got that ending, though, I know who the killer is and how they're going to get caught. I do an extensive outline. They usually take about one to three months. And I'm literally sitting down six, seven hours a day just doing the outline. Uh, so an outline is a stick figure, okay? It's, it's not really well fleshed out. And a lot of times when I finish the outline and I start actually making the stick figure into a three-dimensional person, um, you realize that things you thought were really good don't really work when you're making a real-life situation. Uh, mm -hmm. Example. My hero is a 130 pound um, uh, accountant. And in my outline, my, I don't put in a lot of his background. I have him surrounded by six thugs in an alley and he beats them off with karate. Well, as I'm writing that scene, I say, wait a minute. Even if he knows a karate, a 138 pound accountant is not gonna be able to fight off these guys. Maybe he gives them tax advice instead, you know, and says, I'll do your tax return if you don't beat me up or whatever. But <laughs> these situations that look aren't great on paper, a lot of times they don't work out. You also realize that you sometimes need extra characters that you never thought about because of the way the story is developing. So boy meets girl, boy and girl fall in love, boy and girl get back. Pretty easy, right? But what if it turns out that the boy is a liberal Democrat, and the girl's a conservative Republican. Oh, my God, would they really get married? So I say, oh, I'm going to need a third character, someone from the Libertarian Party that gets them both to join the Libertarian Party. And then, so I had never thought about this Libertarian Party guy before I started writing. So it's, it's that thing, as you're changing your 30-page outline into a 400-page book, uh, a lot of stuff, not a lot of stuff, but stuff does change. And I'm actually in the middle of writing the seventh um, uh, Robin Lockwood. I'm about 300 pages in right now. And I've been adding characters, expanding okay. scenes as I go along. And I'll, I'll be writing. I say, oh, wait a minute. I got to go back to uh, chapter three and describe this this character because I never described him when I in the in the outline. 
Okay, so so there is room for spontaneity, and that's how it works. You think you're going somewhere, but sometimes a character nudges, and 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 that's a very interesting insight into your work. But it leads me to another, well, many questions. Uh, how do you choose uh, who's going to be the protagonist in your stories? Uh, does the story suggest it's a Robin? Lockwood, or does Robin have a mind of her own and give you plots? So initially, um, I did standalones. Uh, the first seven books uh, that I wrote were, were standalones. Uh, and then I, I did five books with Amanda Jaffe that were sprinkled there around other standalones. Then I had four Dana Cutler. Uh, when it's a series, obviously, the the Robin Lockwood character has to be in it because it's a series. So uh, I have Robin in there and uh, uh, I build the story around her. In the standalones, what I do is I try to figure out who is the most appropriate type of person to put into this storyline. So, so it might be a man, it might be a woman, uh, it just depends on what works. And uh, for instance, in uh, Gone but Not Forgotten, it's probably my best book. It's certainly my most popular. It was a movie. It sold over a million copies. It was my big breakthrough. It was uh, it still sells. It was on New York Times bestseller list for 10 weeks, got up to number three. So it was a big deal. And uh, initially, um, I had a male main character, and the the book basically is about a uh, an attorney representing the worst human being who ever lived, who may or may not be a serial killer. We know he's a killer, but uh, there there the book takes place in two ten year periods, so we know initially in the first ten years this guy was like a monster. But is he still? And so it was the issue, the, the, the ethical and moral issue is, as an attorney, how do you represent someone who's really that horrible? Yeah. Well, my first draft, I had a male main character. And the serial killer is someone who, who tortures and murders women who are uh, the wives of successful businessmen. So... I have this scene the first time the lawyer meets the uh, the serial killers, Martin Darius. And they meet at night in a high rise office building around eight o'clock when the only people in the high rise are the cleaning crews. So it's pretty spooky, but I have represented serial killers. Yeah. And so if you're in a contact visiting room with someone who is a murderer or has taken a human life, you have a little bit of a, antenna up yeah but, but if it's a serial killer who kills women you know you're not their type so your your tension level is down here so i'm writing this thing and i think well if i have a male in this scene the tension level is going to be teeny what if it was a woman who fit the the prototype of the type of person that this guy kills Silence, said, oh, silence of the Lambs. Is that is that what you're referring to? That well, I wrote this before Silence of the Lambs. Gone, gone okay, came so out in 19... first. Yeah, okay. Gone came out in 1993. Okay. So I'm thinking, okay, I've got to do a sex change. I've got to have a female main character. Mm -hmm. And so that's because I realized in the in the case where you have this woman who fits the type of person this guy kills and tortures, isolated in this height, the tension level is going to be through the roof. And so that dictated that I have a woman main character as opposed to a male. So okay. that's one example of how the thinking goes. Okay. Now, that raises another question, uh, which again, deals with you as a person. Um, as you said, you, you had a wonderfully successful career as a defense attorney. How in the world did you drift into writing best <laughs> novels? 
Okay. And, and how do you how do you view the two roles? I mean, uh, well, I mean, my my writing career has been bizarre. It's like the weirdest deal. First of all, when I was twelve years old in seventh grade, I decided because I read so many Perry Masons that I was going to be a criminal defense lawyer who did murder cases when I grew up. And it's the only thing I ever wanted to do. And I, I did that for 25 years. Now, as far as the writing goes, I never in a million years thought about being a writer because I read so many books, I was in awe of writers. So it didn't, you know, I thought you had to be, you know, like Einstein or Shakespeare to do that stuff. So literally, I never thought about writing a novel growing up and, and even into my 30s. Uh, when I was in my last semester, I worked my way through law school by uh, teaching junior high in the South Bronx and then going at night. And so I had time to eat and breathe and that was about it. Uh, but my, my last summer, I, had to, I graduated in three years like the day students by going summers to get the extra credits. My wife got a job. Uh, she graduated, and then uh, I had a job waiting for me in Oregon. So I had three three uh, classes. I just had to get D's in them to graduate, and uh, basically had a free summer because I didn't have to work. And I thought, what will I do with myself? Because I'd always worked. This is the first time I'd had a free summer in centuries. And I thought, I'm going to try to solve what for me was one of life's great mysteries, which is how do these guys write fill up 400 pages with ideas. So I, I spent the summer writing a really bad book that I never tried to get published. <laughs> but I really enjoyed the writing. And uh, when I was in my 30s, I, I started occasionally writing short stories, maybe one every two years. They got rejected right away. Uh, but then in my mid-30s, I got a... a, a novel, a, a short story published by a national uh, magazine, Mike Shane Mystery Magazine. And I got some self-confidence. Uh, and so I started, uh, I had always, I'd come in contact with the Peyton Allen murder case, which is an Oregon case that I think is the single most complex and bizarre murder case in American history, not just Oregon. And nobody knew about it because back in the 70s when I was clerking uh, at the Court of Appeals, uh, there, you know, there, there weren't very many writers in Oregon. Now we have great writers. So I decided to write a uh, fictional version of Peyton Now. And I had five chapters in the outline done. Now I had, I had only had one writing class my whole life. It was a C plus in creative writing in college. I had no idea what the hell I was doing. I didn't know about agents or what you do with a manuscript when you finish. And I got a call out of the blue from Marty Bauer. And Marty and I had gone to law school together. I moved to Oregon from New York. He'd stayed in New York. And uh, I hadn't seen him in years. And he said uh, he and his wife wanted to come to Oregon on vacation. Could we get together? I said, yeah, that sounds great. You'll stay at my house and I'll take time off and, you know, show you Mount Hood and blah, blah, blah. So when I'm driving him back from the airport, I asked him what he was doing. And he said he was one of three lawyers for the largest literary agency in the world. And I said, Marty, I'm writing a book. And he said, oh, my God. But actually, he was really nice. I told him I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Could I show my five chapters to someone at the agency and have them write and say, hey, this is amazing. Keep writing or, you know, it's really awful. Do something else. And uh, he took it back to New York and without asking me, sold the book. So that is how I... <laughs> Broke in. I had, you know, I came home, uh, came back to the office from uh, a trial and everyone's sitting around with champagne. I said, oh, what happened? They said, well, your agent called, which I didn't know I had. And <laughs> said, you say, sold your book for you. I said, oh, OK. That's good. So uh, I had two books uh, that were published in my 30s. Um, and then I quit for 12 years because my law practice got really excited. And uh, the same year my first book came out, I argued the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, in between the first and second book, I started doing major cases. So it, it was what I wanted to do since I was a kid. Then in 1992, I, uh, my wife and I had a dinner party at our house. And after dinner, I got 
into a conversation with one of the guests that gave me an idea for a third book. So I said, oh, you know, I haven't had a book published in 12 years. It might be fun to do another one. So I knocked off this book, which turned into be out to be gone and not forgotten. Um, called up my agent, said, you know, I, I got a, a third book. You know, would you take a look at it? She said, I'd love to. She said, but uh, my, my son's getting married in Paris and I'm going to be in Europe until uh, early July. So I can't look at the book until then. I said, no, you know, you waited 12 years for me. I can wait a couple of weeks for you. <laughs> so I said, I'll just send it. And when you get a chance, look at it. Well, a week before she came back, people started sending me letters. Now, these were people I hadn't been in contact with for years from all over the country. And each letter had a copy of an article in the New York Times business section. And this was back when the legal thriller craze just started. Uh, 1987, Scott Turow pre does Presumed Innocent. John Grisham comes out in 1989 with The Firm. And the article said that every American wanted to read legal thrillers but the publishers had no books. And they said that uh, lawyers were sending in manuscripts to try to capitalize on the legal thriller craze, which was books written by lawyers about law, but most of them were lousy books. They were badly written or they were well-written, but really dull. And in the article, it said, there was one kind of lawyer that every publisher in America would kill his mother to get a hold of. And that was a criminal defense lawyer who had written a book about law stuff. And I'm thinking that God had created a genre that only I and the entire universe fit into. So uh, my agent came back the next week. She's brilliant. Um, she decided to auction the book off. There was a two-day auction for it. Oh, Oh. And uh, to my shock and amazement, because I literally, quite frankly, until she used the word auction, never thought, you know, anything. I just, I thought it was a nice book. I hoped that, you know, I'd have a third book published. And the next thing I know, like I said, I'm on the New York Times bestseller list for 10 weeks. I'm selling a million copies. I have 27 foreign publishers, uh, Book of the Month Club, and uh, anything you can imagine that you dream of if you're an author happened with that book. Well, I'm afraid we're running out of time, Phil, but what a what an enchanted life you have lived, both as a successful attorney. And frankly, I admire you for making the leap from attorney to writer, but I have two minutes to go. Could you tell me, uh, my, my favorite trick of the day question, could you tell me in two minutes um, if you, could spend a day with an author, a living or dead, who would you choose to spend the day with? Well, it wouldn't be one author. It would be John Earl Stanley Gardner, uh, Ellery Queen, who, who are really two people, Frederick Danny and Manfred Lee, uh, John Dixon Carr. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, we just sit around and, and talk about the mechanics of killing people in locked rooms and uh, building up suspense. So I, I, I think that would be, my choice would be to get all of these guys that I pay uh, homage to in the, uh, in the murder of Black Oaks, get them all sit down. We have a latte at uh, one of the local coffee shops and just uh, talk business for, uh, for an hour or so. I was thinking maybe malt whiskey, but probably. <laughs> A latte would work <laughs> anyway. Um, Phil, your two books, Darkest Place, already out. Everybody should go out and buy it. And I have to say, as a fan of English mysteries, Murder at Black Oaks sounds fascinating. I can hardly wait. Oh, you know, it's sort of exciting. Um, the, the biggest thing was how many books. <laughs> Again, like I said, I never ever thought I'd publish any books. And then to see all these things going by, and 
uh, brought back great memories. Uh, and then it was really exciting to see Executive Privilege and Gone But Not Forgotten pop up in Hearthstone, which of course was my baby. That was my my first one. So as soon as I saw that, I, I got a little pitter patter. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh, you know, that's, that was the, the first one. So uh, uh, it was pretty exciting. Well, it's impressive, I can say that. But truly, they're wonderful books. So you are a very, very, very gifted writer. Worthy Brown's daughter took me 30 years to write. Uh, it's it's the only one I one of my books that's it, not strictly a legal thriller. It's a historical novel. But I really make an effort uh, to make each one of them completely different from the book that went before. I, I hate or I try very hard not to get uh, you know typecast as one type of book. So. That's the big challenge for me. The hardest thing for me is getting the idea that is complex enough to fill up 400 pages and really different from the other books I've read. That uh, constant pursuit of the surprise and the novel well, it's a vast and great universe of that, particular universe, especially in the law. And uh, I suppose you draw constantly from those past experiences, don't you? Not really. Um, <clears throat> the, I only have one of my books that's based on one of my own cases. I do have snippets, uh, stuff that happened in some of my cases. But most of the time, it's just all made up. Uh, most real oh. murder cases do not make great stories. Oh. You know, the guy goes into a bar, drinks too much, and gets into an argument about whether the Lakers or the Blazers are better and stabs a guy in front of 40 witnesses. And there's no romantic interest. There's no alternate suspect. So most of the murder cases that I handle, they're fascinating for me as a lawyer because there are legal issues and motions to suppress and all this other stuff. But as far as liter being fodder for literature, eh, it doesn't usually work out that way. I see, well, that, that is very interesting. I, I, I hadn't thought about that, you're right. Life uh, has its own uh, set of requirements and fiction has something else. Yeah, I, I always like to explain that I loved being a lawyer. You know, a lot of people say, oh man, you must have been, just thrilled when you got out of law and started writing. I actually has had as much fun being a lawyer as I did, uh, as I've been having with the writing career, because I have these super terrific, exciting cases that are like the ones that people pay money to read about or see on TV. So I did all the stuff in the books, I did in real life. So uh, it was a very, very exciting and, and, and uh, very worthwhile, uh, you know, actually of the two, the legal one is the one that I have the best memories of, uh, getting innocent people out of prison, yes. Who, yes. Uh, are, you know, arguing the Supreme Court. And, you know, I love the writing. I mean, I just really enjoy the hell out of it. But being a, a criminal defense lawyer is much more rewarding, I would have to say. Hey, you've been multiply blessed, my friend. Well, thank you, Phil, for this absolutely mind-boggling and delightful interview and the insights into a defense attorney as well as a New York Times best-selling author. I could really almost dislike you, you know. <laughs> so jealous, but so pleased to have your books to read. Well, ladies and gentlemen of our audience, thank you for joining us. Um, I want to remind you that Just Read It comes out once every two months. So if you don't want to miss Phil or any of the gang, please uh, 
subscribe. Uh, we don't sell your name. We don't send you advertising. You just don't want to miss us. And so till next time, this is Caroline Miller for Just Read It. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And next time you got to tell me if you figured out how the person got murdered in the elevator. I'll make something up. I'm a right. <laughs> Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.